My name is uh, Dr. Benjamin Porter. I'm the director of the Phoebe Hearst Museum and a uh, professor in the Near Eastern Studies Department. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Bubel, who's an associate professor of archaeology in the Department of Geography at the University of Lethbridge, in Canada. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Archaeology, Anthropology, and Geography from the University of Lethbridge, mm -hmm. a Master's degree in Eastern Mediterranean Archaeology from the University of Leuven, and a PhD in Archaeology from the University of Leuven. Sean has been directing projects since 1999 and has excavated at sites in the state of Israel, Turkey, Egypt, Belgium, France, Poland, uh, British Columbia, Canada, as you'll see today throughout Alberta. Uh, she's currently the president of the Archaeological Society of Alberta and co-editor co -editor of the Alberta Archaeological Review. Today she'll be speaking about mammoth trackers, bison hunters, rock artists, and fur traders, highlights of Alberta archaeology. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Buell. Thanks so much, Ben. And thanks everyone for being here, and thanks for having me. I was on the fence of whether or not to talk about all of Alberta archaeology and kind of give you a taste or talk about some of the research projects I was involved in. So I made hopefully the best of both worlds to showcase not only the different types of sites we have, but also some of the projects that I've had the opportunity to work on. So, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me uh, throughout the presentation. I'm happy to stop and answer them. So a little orientation of where we are. So the province is just north of Montana. That's the closest state to us. It's a fairly large province, so around 255,000 square miles. So about 90,000 more than California. Um, from north to south, around 800 miles if we want to drive it. And so sometimes I get to and I drive. I live in the very south, so Leftridge is about here. And some of my projects are in the very north. So it takes a couple of days to get there and to start those projects. And I've had the opportunity to work throughout the province, but those are more contracts that I uh, do with the consultants. But I'll showcase Southern Alberta and a little bit about Northern Alberta too. And this is a map that Eric Damkar made. He's from the Archaeological Survey. So everything is run um, by an agent, an agency in the government. And so we send all of our documents and all our reports to them. And they've created this master map of around 40,000 archaeological sites throughout the province. And you'll see kind of hot zones in the south. That's where most of the population lives. And that's where most of the industry is happening. So of course, many of the archaeological projects are tied to the industry. And then up north, you've probably heard about the area like Fort McMurray, which is that highlighted red zone there. So lots of oil and gas. So we have a lot of sites being recorded because, again, of the industry. So yeah. So we'll go from south to north, and then we'll showcase the different sites in between. So I thought I'd start with a fairly small site. This site's called the Tabor Child site. It was famous in the 1960s because um, the archaeologists that worked on this site thought that it was the oldest site in North America. So at first, they suggested a date of 60,000 years. Eventually, that was revived revised to 40,000 years, and then a reinvestigation decades later showcased that that site was actually not at all that old. So we know now that it dates to around 5,000 years ago. But at the beginning, Southern Alberta was one of the places that people were looking for evidence of populations arriving in North America and establishing themselves in our continent. So kind of the landscape you can see there, and the site itself is on the side of the cliff, embedded and um, enclosed kind of in these mud deposits, which we now know was the case at this particular site. So I do, the research that I do there is more monitoring, just to make sure that the site stays intact and is preserved for future research. One of the sites that I do spend a lot more time on is the Wally's Beach site. So here, this is a site Again, not exactly ideal conditions, but it's one of the best sites that we've got. So in 1951, we constructed a dam called the St. Mary's Dam. It's on the St. Mary's River. And it flooded the area to create what we now have is this big lake. Um, when, the when the lake gets used by the farmers, it draws down and basically exposes this huge area. 
And then with the winds of southern Alberta, we have a deflated zone, lots of archaeological material popping up and being exposed and then being hopefully collected by the right people. Sometimes that's a bit of an issue, but um, that's for another time to talk about. Um, in any case, so I go out and often monitor the site, especially when the lake levels are quite low, because it's potentially one of the sites where we do have the opportunity to find evidence of early populations in North America. So Alberta could be one of these hot spots where we can see people coming in through the Beringian zone and then into the North American continent. So here you can see when the lake levels are high, the site's fairly well protected, but as the lake gets drawn down, we can see the exposure of the sides of the shore and then eventually to the point that we have very little water at all and then the winds start blowing and go out and survey and then you can find amazing things like mammoth footprints just sitting on the surface. And they don't last for very long, so this is why I'm often out there when the conditions are right because in 48 hours sometimes there are no more footprints to be seen. So that's how quick everything gets deflated. So the archaeological material starts to collapse and then you have this palimpsest of everything from historic remains to mammoth footprints at this particular site. But often you get lucky and you can see these beautiful trackways across the open landscape. So we monitor those, we check for artifacts, <coughs> We check for hopefully good context of these artifacts. So my colleagues at the University of Calgary have found Clovis projectile points with horse blood DNA on them. So we know that the people were hunting the Ice Age megafauna at this site around 12,000 years ago. But unfortunately, it's in this deflated surface context. So we've been trying to investigate stuff by excavating down lower to see if we can find something in a stratigraphical high quality um, condition. So far, stay tuned, the answer is we don't have that yet. Um, that on the left there are camel bones, so we also have Ice Age camel at the site, so we have horse, camel and mammoth for sure, and the artifacts that kind of go with this time period, but no smoking gun yet to have them embedded or in the context that we can trust. This is a variety of different artifacts that are found from the site. So like I said, everything from early stuff to really late period artifacts, all on this palimpsest on the surface. So one of the exciting things right in our backyard that we get to go to and explore and monitor. And the, uh, that site is potentially one of these sites that are going to yield this information. Another site that I worked on called the Purple Springs site also had the opportunity to find this potentially stratigraphically clean context to showcase these early occupation periods in the province. Unfortunately, although we find lots of artifacts that date to the very early phases of the North American uh, presence, we have not found one in situ or in a good stratigraphic context. So Purple Springs, a site that I worked on probably oh, six years ago now, um, we found a fulsome projectile point on the surface eroded out of the dunes. So we went in and organized an excavation where you can see my students here working in the dune field trying to find this beautiful stratigraphic context. So uh, great possibility, lots of different archaeological remains. Um, and in the end, after the excavations, we found nice stratigraphic separability, so early paleosols all the way up to pretty recent paleosols. And in paleosol 3 and paleosol 2, we found artifacts that date to, this is an oxbow projectile point, so dates to 4,500 years ago, and then a pelican lake dates around 2,800 in a nice clear context. But then at the very bottom underneath paleosol 3, we hit glacial clustering clay, and once you hit that, Basically, you're dealing with glaciers that have been present across the province. And in this area, a kilometer thick of ice was sitting on the province. So there's no way that anybody was there at that time. So you just close up shop and, you know, hope for another site to appear. Um, so great fun, of course, great learning for the students, but not exactly yielding the fulsome context that we had hoped, but still great archaeology. 
Now just north of Purple Springs is a site called Finn Castle. It's where I've spent a lot of my time since 2003, so on and off, because um, the site has yielded so much material and kind of has changed the way we look at a time period called the Basant time period. So a little bit of landscape context, so again in a big dune field, so lots of deflated zones, lots of exposure, artifacts being eroded and being exposed. I started the project thinking that this was going to be a very short project, so I went in in 2003 to survey the area because it was being unfortunately looted. Uh, I am still working on this project, it has not stopped since uh, just because of the material that has come out. So there you can see us surveying the area that was being looted here and getting a sense of what the site could potentially yield in terms of the archaeological remains. So this was in 2003. You can see the deflated zones there from the winds exposing the sands. And this is us looking west. So this is the top of a parabolic dune which surrounds the site. I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, but you can see here this is all dune field. And this area is a little bit wetter and it's been being used for both um, cattle ranching and a lot of agricultural activity, but the dune field has been pretty much left alone, so never been plowed, so good potential for archaeological preservation. And the site itself is about there. You can see kind of a little white area, and that's the parabolic dune that surrounds the site. So I started that project in 2003, and like I said, I'm not finished. So here you can see the dune. Um, just my base points around and I've divided the site into what I just call the east area and the west area. Um, they're basically linked, but because the site is pretty large, I had to focus my teams uh, depending on what I was working on at that particular season. And the site extends into this area too, but this is leased by a different land um, owner, a rancher. So we've concentrated here, but we've surveyed all across that whole area. So one of the first things that I did was I modeled the topography, so created this um, digital ele elevation model just to showcase the parabolic dune and its um, extent. This parabolic dune, as you'll see later, um, postdates the site, so it was an interesting discovery. Uh, in any case, so I've expanded the excavation area across this entire about 130 meter area of that part of the parabolic dune. Around 133 square meters have been excavated between 2004 and 2012 and I still need to work on the east area here and expand this block a little bit and finish that up. But that's why I say it's not yet finished. But And there you can see some of my students. Most of my projects I run as archaeological field schools. So there you can see the students excavating. Um, here you can see the faunal material very close to the surface. In other places at the site, it's buried quite deeply. One of the signals that the, the dune was post-dating the site. Um, but there you can see the students excavating, reaching the bone bed, and then recording that information. So yeah, so <laughs> a lot of bones. <laughs> excavating a bison kill site, well, you... Uh, you get to learn your faunal material quite <laughs> effectively. So here you can see the students exposing the bone bed. Um, everything was screened through a 1 8 inch mesh. I was really lucky there because I had sand. So I could pull out the micro debutage and really think about resharpening, use of the tools, etc. So this was a great um, thing that I could do at this site as compared to some of the other sites I work on. But, and then of course, recording all of that information. So some of the results I'll highlight now. This is one of the maps from the east area of the site. So you can see the density of the faunal material. So we recorded um, each faunal remain as best we could, right? Assuming that it was identifiable and identifiable in more than five centimeters in length. Um, all of the debutage is recorded three-dimensionally. Uh, of course, the stone tools, the fire broken rock, and then lots of um, collection of the burnt fragments of bone within that one by one meter resolution. So one of the maps made in GIS, and here you can see just a summary of the artifacts that have been recovered from that site so far. So around uh, 15 
thousand, sixteen thousand bones had to be identified to the species, the element, the portion, etc. Um, several of them were tiny, tiny bone fragments that were burnt, so that gives us the 250,000, give or take, burnt bone pieces that were all counted, cleaned, and then lots of, of course, debitage and artifacts and things like that. One of the things that became very clear at this site is that we have an initial kill, so th because we have projectile points, but we also have carcasses that are still in more or less um, complete articulation, or at least portions. So of those um, analyses, I was able to determine there, that there were at least 63 bison that were killed at the site, and this was done as a one-time event, and they were probably in and out in less than a week. So organized, hunted, butchered, and then back to their base camp. So you can see articulated vertebral columns there where they would just portion out sections of the animals and leave sections that they didn't get to or didn't need to process at the time. Um, things like this, which I have a, a close up. You can see how they cut off the legs there. So you can see a fracture in the metacarpal area where the lower part of the leg was just discarded and left. So this we call primary butchering when they actually just disarticulate the carcass and then often move portions of the carcass either to a different part of the site to work on it further, different site itself, back to the, the base camp, etc. So at this site, we have both the primary and the secondary butchering that's happening. And so we can see things like marrow extraction, so lots of removal of those marrow components out of the long bones. Um, we see things like um, concentrations of the lower limbs discarded, but in other cases, concentrations of some of the fragments into what you'll see in a minute, boiling areas to render the grease. Um, mandibles clustered together. This is in a one by one meter unit. So if you can imagine the size of a bison head, you're lucky if you get one in a one by one meter unit, let alone here in this case, we had at least uh, three, just because you have, need left and rights, right? Three bison um, represented in this one by one. So what are they doing there? They're cutting out the tongues. So probably some person within the community, likely a, a woman was in charge of rendering the tongues, getting the tongues out of the animal, and people were bringing those portions of the animal to that person, and that person was processing at that particular spot, so taking the tongues out and, and then hanging them, so yeah. So lots of great, fantastic preservation, so we can tell lots of stories. Yes? Very Ooh. Do you want to know now, or do you want to stay tuned? It's part of the story. <laughs> uh, 2,500. Speaking of preservation, what is the nature of the sediments that would foster this? All sand. Yeah. So, and um, also something that I'll showcase. The dune covered the site almost immediately, right after the kill, because oh. the preservation is so good yeah. that, yeah. So I'm really, it was an amazing site to kind of start as a looting salvage project that it has eventually become a full-blown major research project of, of mine, so yeah. Um, lots of, like I said, lots of mandible preservation. So I was able to age all of the mandibles. So a lot of them are adults, so they fall in the latter category there. But we had lots of juvenile um, bison too, and based on the eruption of the molars and the premolars and the loss of the deciduous teeth, you can actually tell the exact window of age. So based on that, I was able to determine it's a late fall to kind of, or sorry, late summer to early fall kill event, which makes sense because a lot of the groups are coming together in the late fall to basically create um, the cache of the meat and, and yeah and the bison are also coming together at that point in time too so so yeah so this fits well with what we know about the time period that a lot of these major kill events are taking place not all but a lot of them this went nicely with the data that showcases the um, male and female um, animals within the herd so often in the fall, the males will rejoin the herd with the females in the juvenile population. And here we have, based on measurements of the first phalanxes, we can see a clustering of both the males and the females within the population. 
So again, these two things kind of go together to really um, allow us to be confident in that late summer, early fall time period. So yeah, so. The fire broken rock, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea? I mean, are we talking about um, months, years? Based on the dates that I have and kind of the, the sense I get from the sediments themselves, I'd say within months. Yeah, not even a year because the exposure of the faunal remains on the surface in southern Alberta, which is really, really dry, starts to really flake those bones kind of open. Of course, the meat would have to be. Um, taken off, like it eventually rots off. But yeah, uh, a lot of the surface bone that's, if it's exposed for even a year, will start to become so friable that you'll see that and none of the bones are like that at all. But I promise to come back to the dune. Yeah. How far away is this from the um, smash head? Oh, very close. And I'll talk about head smashed in too. It's about 100 kilometers, so 60 miles to the east of head smashed in. And they would have been using a lot of these sites at the same time. So, yeah. It all depends where the bison are. So, head smashed in was never used every single year. It's used when the conditions are right for that site. And when the conditions are right for another site, they would be at a different site. So, yeah. So, fire broken rock, again, not very exciting. But when you look at the fire broken rock in combination with the burnt bone and with the um, bone that's been smashed open to get the marrow, you again sort of see these locations of grease rendering and grease rendering is really important because um, basically you use boiling stones and you put in the, the bone pieces, you get the grease to float to the surface, you scoop off that grease, you mix the grease with berries and dried bison meat to make the pemmican, right? And then that gets you through the winter time. So a lot of these late fall sites will have lots of fire broken rock and lots of evidence of the boiling and the production of the actual pemmican at the site, so yeah. So we see highlights in the northeast section of the sites where you can see these pockets of activity in combination with other things. Um, lots of the tongue removal is happening in this part and sort of the upper areas where they're boiling and working on the secondary processing of the bison. And this was a surprise find, one of the things that has kind of put Fincastle on the map. Well, a couple of things, but this is definitely one of the things. So as we were excavating through those really clear bone beds, we would think that we would be finished with the bones. Everything would be mapped, and then I'd have the students go down at least another two um, excavation levels to make sure that we're cleared off, right? So you want to make sure you have stratigraphy underneath that to really contextualize those remains. So we would go down for another five, another 10, another 15, and as you're thinking that you're almost finished, <laughs> then you hit the faunal remains underneath that. So these were always both exciting and, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you, you're with me. <laughs> um, so here's a pretty good picture of one of those cases where the bone is all here, and then this is the top of a metapodial that was shoved into the ground. Now when I first discovered this case and that case there, I had thought, well, maybe uh, a bison just kind of got stuck and then they just chopped off the leg and left it behind, right? It could be just one of these fluke situations where this is the case. Um, but I've now found 12 of these and they're all in a very kind of consistent context. And that context is um, the bones themselves are sitting right on top of a glacial lacustrian clay bed but then the upright bones are actually pushed down vertically into the clay itself. So no evidence of a pit structure. They're not scooping out the clay to put in the bones and then covering it back up. Um, something else is going on here, which I'll show you in a minute. So first I wanna highlight some of these beautiful features that we've discovered. So a lot of them have mandibles or a combination of mandibles and scapulae together. So here you can see a mandible and a scapula side by side. Sometimes um, upright metapodials or a combination of metapodials. So these bones here, um, that's that case there. This is a carnivore skull actually. So some wolf likely was at the hunt 
and they put the skull of the canid down inside there. Um, this is an upright with three scapulae placed in a vertical orientation. Um, this one is a combination of bones. Obviously, they don't normally go together. This is the uh, axis, so it's on the top. And this is a mandible, and these are bones from the feet of the bison. And this one here is the most beautiful. And this was the, one of the ones that appeared in Archaeology magazine and also is in kind of a few articles. So there's the top of it. So there are uh, four mandibles and a tibia placed all in um, sort of an out fanning position. So, um, and all of this was covered. So the bone bed is taken off. Then we hit the clay. Then we dig through the clay. And then we see the top being exposed. And then, of course, we section that and expose the feature itself. So what are these? Right? Um, you, of course, don't want to go to the, they're ceremonial right away, <laughs> although we're tempted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you don't know what it is, it must be ceremonial. <laughs> um, but um, putting everything together, so um, they could have been pegs to tie down the hides to scrape them. They could have been part of the boiling features. They could be part of a number of utilitarian functions. All of these, which are well documented at many bison kill sites and other types of processing sites, all showcase a location or a position in connection with the surface that they're working. But in all of these cases, the surface was never part of where the bones are. They're clearly pressed down into and underneath the working and walking surface that the people were engaged with. So something else is going on. And then when you look at the, the selection of the bones as compared to just um, pegs to tie down things, it's clearly intentional and clearly positioned within this context. Now, there are some parallels which we see in North Dakota at a few sites that date to a thousand years later. So, Fincastle has these unique, likely ceremonial types of maybe offerings back to the bison spirit. I mean, there are lots of suggestions that you can make and that my First Nations partners have suggested, but um, sort of a unique thing that are even different than those uprights in North Dakota. These are kind of much more elaborate and, and much, uh, there are far more of them than, than we find in the Dakota region. So I'll come back to the Dakotas too, um, but just for a second, so the context of these uprights and the bones themselves or the, the bone bed. So you can see some of the bones positioned here, here and there. Stratigraphically, like I said, the, the sand is kind of over top and then we hit the glacial lacustrian clays and the bones are really sitting very close to the glacial lacustrian clays and the uprights are placed into the glacial lacustrian clays. clays. If you've ever excavated clay, especially glacial lacustrian clay, you would probably not want to stay in the business long because it is nasty, because it's hard as a rock. And so as soon as you get to that level, either you have to go really fast or um, you got to wait to get some moisture back because it is so, it's like concrete. So there's, there's no way that if this, there was not water present at this time, without digging a pit, there's no way to get in those bones. So a couple things came out of the geoarchaeology at the site. One is that there must have been lots of water present to be able to push those bones in place. Um, the second thing, the sand is over top and you can see this is the north section and that's towards the east. So remember the dune kind of went around. So if I compare the stratigraphy on the west area to the east area, I can literally see the dune just climbing and so we have to excavate deeper and deeper because of, of course the surface of the dune that we see currently um, is kind of cresting in this case maybe about 15 meters to the east so if I start there I have to dig a lot deeper down to get to this layer of bone which is fairly consistent across the entire site so the current topography post dates the topography at the time of the kill at the time of the kill, it must have been wet and it must have um, 
had some sand close by to the east, or sorry, to the west that has been blown then eastward to eventually bury the site fairly quickly. So here you can see that glacial lacustrian clay, the bones, and kind of a combination of clay and sand right underneath. And there, that's the surface that would be a little bit towards the west. So the difference to, um, stratigraphically, you can really map out nicely across the site. So all in all, this is what I think is going on. Here we have Fincastle Lake. And like I said, it's really different if you move away from the Dooney area. So here you see the dunes coming in. Here you see also a marsh that's an interdune pond. And this area here has pockets of sand, but not like it's all kind of broken and agriculturally used now. But you can imagine that this was likely a fairly large dune field area with lots of interdune zones of lacustrian um, bodies of water. And then that all sat on this glacial lacustrian clay that was present once the glaciers retreated from the area. So what turned out, well, uh, the first hypothesis was that this was an area where they drove the bison into the parabolic dune. They m would have needed to create some kind of corralling, like the ruby site or a site like that, because that dune, the bison would just run right over. <laughs> it's nothing to them, right? So they're, but you know, you work with the topography and you create these corralled zones. At the time, we thought that the site dated to around 1,500, which matched a lot of other zones or a lot of other sites in this zone that suggested corralling, etc. But no evidence of post features, no evidence of then this dune being at the time of the site. So, uh, re-looking re at the data, I think what's going on is we have an ambush site. As the bison were watering in this interdune zone, the hunters, very well aware of this, basically came in and used it as kind of an ambush site. And we have a very similar site about 50 kilometers to the south of this. So that matched very well. So. And that makes sense with the uprights too, being able to be pushed down into this wet glacial clay. So. And in terms of the dates, this was a little bit of a surprise. So we took bets actually, because the projectile points were very clearly from a single time period. The bone bed was nice and crisp stratigraphically. So a really good single event snapshot in time with the, the good um, preservation of 133 projectile points. It seemed kind of a closed case in terms of the time period. So the, the guess was around 1500. The radiocarbon dates on the bones all came back a thousand years older, so 2500 years ago. And then I was not just satisfied with that, so I did a whole series of OSL dating. Here is the great glacial lacustrian clay. Here's the bone, and here is some sand right over top. So you can see that I'm ranging between, this is the clay, so dating to around 2,900, and this is the sands over top 2,000 years ago, and the bone right in between. So those two dating methods corroborated the 2,500 year, which was a bit of a shock, right? So you wanna make sure that your stratigraphy and your dates kind of make sense. So all of that together with the projectile points made me re-examine the nature of the site and relook at what's going on in the northwestern Great Plains. So you can see the variability. I, I'm showcasing these beauties here because they're made out of Knife River Flint, and Knife River Flint is, Flint is sourced, to no, sourced to North Dakota, which was my only link with the uprights. So things were kind of coming together here. Now unfortunately, I'm gonna skip that, unfortunately, um, North Dakota sites with a few uprights that we've got date to, like I said, 1500, 1200 years ago. So, um, our Fincastle hunters coming out of the region of North Dakota, coming into the area of the Northwestern Plains, are they the earliest of the Basant people in this neighborhood? Maybe, right? I mean, I think so. <laughs> um, so here are kind of some of the sites that I've looked at and compared. So a lot of connections with this area here. So. And more than 80% of the material is knife river flint. So it's not just a little, it's a lot. 
So probably if they don't have direct trade networks, they're coming in from the area. So yeah. Um, Heads Mast in Buffalo Jump. So like I said, just a little bit to the west as uh, another project that I work on and and I seem to get roped into these buys and kill sites <laughs> now. <laughs> I don't know how that happens, but um, the UNESCO World Heritage Site, it's an amazing site. If you ever had a have a chance to go to Alberta, you should really visit Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump. So lots of projects have been done at the site, and there you kind of see the landscape connected. Um, this is right beside the jump itself, and there's right here, this is the Calderwood jump. So like I said, they don't always use that same jump year after year. They're going to go where conditions are best. So sometimes they'd use the Calderwood. Obviously they went to Fincastle and other places around. So I'll just quickly talk about this because this was a little side project that we were um, doing at the jump site. So here you can see us excavating just, so the jump's up here, so just uh, below the jump in the processing area. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to expose a big roasting pit that they would have placed the animals into, or at least sections of the animals, overnight and then open up and kind of celebrate the hunt and the kill. So we wanted to put one of these in the Royal Alberta Museum. So we exposed it, plastered it, dug it out, and put it on a flatbed truck and <laughs> drove it 700 miles north. <laughs> so, and now it's sitting in the museum at the Alberta Museum. So pretty fun. I got to work with paleontologists and learn how to plaster things. And uh, yeah. And one more bison kill site quickly, because there are a lot of them, but I wanted to showcase these because it's not just about these jumps, it's about the different strategies that the First Nations people use to hunt the bison. So here you can see the bone bed eroding out of the side of the cliff, and this is the Twin River site. So lots of erosion and exposure of many of these types of sites. So what we did there is we did our best to collect what we could, and again, not a small quantity of material coming up, um, but a really good showcase of more of the corralling method. So um, funneling the bison into enclosed spaces and then trapping and hunting them there. So this site dates to around 650 years ago. So it's later than the other sites. And writing on stone, also a UNESCO world, well, hopefully soon to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, Again, so like I said, lots of river erosion and exposure. So this was a bit of a fun project in that we had to surface survey in the water, which was exciting. So there you can see my students collecting the artifacts and the, mostly the fauna remains from the site itself. And the site is eroding off of this surface here. So not a jump, but likely a corral as well at Riding on Stone. And then you can see some of the material. So and then that's the probably the bone bed location. So we'll have to open it from above and start to excavate down. I wanted to showcase this site because a lot of the work that I'm doing right now at Writing on Stone is focusing on the rock art rather than the bison bone itself, but because many of these sites have multi-functions or multi-activities going on, you get the, the best of all of these worlds. Um, so the rock art is exposed on these beautiful sandstone panels which are exposed to the wind and lots of erosion. So what we're doing as part of a monitoring program is we go to the different panels, we record the rock art over and over and over again to study the erosion rates and to see what's happening. And also as a way to preserve the records of the site um, because they're gone after a certain amount of time. So I wanted to show, this, show you guys this because you can't really see anything um, if you really squint, you can see a circle that's representing a teepee and there are figures inside. Um, that's what the surface would look like if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, but there's paint, there's petroglyphs, and these are some images that were done more than 100 years ago and they're in the Glenbow archives. So you can see the paintings and the, and the in this case, the petroglyphs, but they're also pictographs. So yeah, so we monitor a whole series of panels every single summer and then record that information in these big uh, databases and there are some uh, pictographs too. So one of the things that we're up to. 
Now that site is tied to another probably ceremonial site called the Noble Point Effigy. And so here you see a figure on the ground. And so we have several of these figures in Alberta. And we, we use the collective term effigy to refer to both the nappy effigy, the creator effigies, and the animal effigies, and then sort of the narrative effigies. This is none of the above, which was also really, really fun to discover. So we mapped it out. I did a lot of um, assessment, not just of the site itself, but of the materials being used, and then really wanted to look at, well, what does it best connect us to? Um, so these are the nappy effigies, so lots of rectangular bodies, um, heads almost always facing the west, um, penis, these things exposed, Nappy the Creator, as the story is told by the First Nations, laying back and being happy and admiring his work that he's done at that particular spot, right, relaxing and enjoying himself. Um, there is a, a, a figure of a turtle, so that would be the, um, the, tur the, the animal effigies, and then the narratives are like stone cairns and stories behind. So this didn't really fit with any of those things. So my work at Writing on Stone was fun because then I started to tie those things together and the effigy at the Noble Point looks a lot like the shield-bodied warriors that are present in the rock art. So we, don't, we can't date the Noble Point effigy, but according to sort of some of our dates from the rock art, it probably dates to the end of the late prehistoric time period. But we have no other parallels to this effigy site. So kind of the new and on the map site type. Oh yeah, some more nappy effigies. So those were all in southern Alberta. And now I just want to pop to the north for a little while because that's where I get to do the late historic stuff. So the fur trade project and that Robin was on last summer. So Fort Vermilion One was occupied around, well, established at seven, in 1798 occupied until 1830 when that site was moved downriver. So this is the Peace River in the northern part of the province in the boreal forest. So a completely different type of archaeology um, and just as fun. So you can see us arriving at the site, the density of the bush. So really, really tough. I need to make sure I know where my students are all the time so they don't get lost. And, <laughs> and then, uh, then, yeah, so us First we have to clear the site, then eventually we establish the excavation units, and then, yeah, expose the, the material remains that we can. So here you can see the students excavating. This is the Boy River Post. So this is just downstream of Fort Vermilion One. So I've kind of combined these because they both represent the early European move into Alberta. So we're quite a bit later than what's going on in the United States. So. Our earliest site is the Boy River Post, and that's 1798, and then Fort Vermilion right after that, and then eventually the Europeans kind of establish themselves throughout the province. So everything is happening in the north first, following the fur trade line. So, yeah. There we are, excavating. So lots of exposure of the fireplaces, big cellars, of course, full of archaeological materials. Um, other things like palisade walls. So here you can see beautiful stratigraphic sections of all of these cuts. You can see the beams still preserved. And this is the boreal forest, so you'd think like based on the moisture, lots of trees, lots of acidity within the forest, but because it's buried under lots and lots of silt layers because of the flooding of the Peace River, we have fantastic preservation, including even the floorboards of the houses, so yeah, so pretty cool. Yeah, so what we were able to establish is based on the architecture, we have evidence of what's called post-in-ground construction. So it's when the early fur traders in the area dug the pit, placed the post into the ground, and then created the sill, and then all of the, the beams of the, the homes on top of that. Eventually that gets replaced by the post on ground construction method and this is around 1830 to 1850 and so we have solid evidence that this is an early fur trade post probably in the case of our guesses Boy River and Fort Vermilion based on the the journals um, but there are lots of sort of things to still be clarified at these sites 
So anyways, some of the stuff that uh, we've discovered. So as, Robin, <laughs> as promised, Robin, finding uh, uh, one of the material remains. So lots of jewelry, lots of, of course, European goods coming in, axes, uh, pocket knives, knives, kettles, etc. And then lots of connections with the First Nations, right? So using the trade silver, putting them on the garments, lots of bead work, lots of even beads still in situ, so we can see the color choices of the bead work and the, the beads being used. So lots of great preservation. And then kind of full circle back to prehistory. So one of the things that we did this summer is we surveyed the Gull Lake site. Again, hoping to find one of these sites that showcase the early peopling into the Alberta province. Um, we found great artifacts, all unfortunately exposed on the surface. Everything from really, really early artifacts dating to probably 9,500, all the way to Métis cabins still standing on the site. So exciting because Winchester and then projectile points just sitting on the surface. Yeah. So, yeah. So pretty fun stuff. And hopefully that's a little bit of a taste of what's going on in our province and uh, one of the sunsets that we got to see this summer. And this was base camp. So, yeah. So thank you. Yes. Yes, for sure. We have evidence. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. um, even the canid skull, lots of these earlier sites, we have evidence of the, a domesticated form of the canids and likely using the terroir. Yeah. Of the, the bison kill stuff, yes. or? Yes, or any mass killing. Yeah, in the province, probably our earliest site is actually not with bison, it's with uh, sheep, mountain sheep, and it dates to around 11,000. Yeah, and that's, yeah, so. And then, of course, the bison stuff will come pretty shortly thereafter, at least the sites we've got. We assume at the very earlier time periods, too, um, but likely not in the at the end of the Ice Age, so that's probably still isolated, mammoth hunting, um, horse hunting, camels, etc. That was probably all kind of an isolated kill event rather than a collective event. And then once we move into the later Holocene time period, then things are pretty quick. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was interesting. I wanted to ask about your first site that you dwelled on the most. Um, Think Castle? We saw a Think lot Castle. of other sites after that, but um, you said that the preservation was really good to mm -hmm. sand on, the, yep. on your um, yep. clay. What kind of clay remains are you finding there? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, I thought that I'd had even some preserved bison patties with plant remains inside that turned out to be sort of later stuff because it was on in the eastern part of the site that wasn't as low as the other parts um, so I, I didn't really trust it to be as old as I had hoped uh, in terms of the kill event once I get stratigraphically low enough not a lot of plant remains we were able to recover so either one of two things um, as that wind is is whipping in a lot of those more light, friable remains, probably a lot of burnt uh, material is being blown out. And so maybe I'll find it a little bit to the east as I dig in that section, or the preservation isn't good enough to have the... So there was no charred wood or anything? No. They, well, how did no. they burn their, their... How did they process the oil? With dung. Okay, so, so the, dung has seeds in it. Yes, exactly, and I don't have any of it preserved enough. Um, I have the burnt bone to sh kind of showcase where that's happening, but none of, like no ash or no sort of, yeah, at that particular spot. But we know that they're using bison patties as fuel for the fire, yeah. Yeah, but unfortunately, like nothing that I've seen so far, but I, I mean, I have tons of sediment samples that haven't been processed yet, so of course we'll, 
will look for these plant remains and fingers crossed we'll find something in there. Um, it'll likely showcase this open plains landscape, but still, right? Good, good to know. Mentioned berries. Yes, yeah. This is an assumption that they are gathering the berries probably from another spot towards the river. The river is about four kilometers north of the site, so probably collecting the berries in this, these more um, riparian zones and then bringing it to the, the kill spot, yeah. But we should find some. Hopefully we should, yeah. <laughs> You had a lot of firecrack rock, um, <laughs> and is, is it locally available? Did they have to bring that in? Yeah, so in this case, they had to bring it. So they had to walk those four kilometers or at least gather it from someplace else. That's the same thing that we see at Head Smashed In. Mm -hmm. So Head Smashed In is on a cliff face, and it's sandstone, but they deliberately walked to the um, alluvial plains right. to collect the quartzites to bring the quartzites yeah, and the granites yeah, rather than yeah. the sandstone because sandstone just falls apart. Do you have so. a weight, total weight for all the fire? Oh, I, I don't, but I, I mean, I do in the database, but right. I've never actually... Well, it would make a great story, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so many tons. I mean, especially if it's a you know, single event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, kill, what they did in order to process yeah. it. Yeah, so exactly. There's the kill, but then there's all the other stuff that has to go on yeah. to make the results of the kill usable. And yeah. that, of course, is going to involve a much wider community. Exactly. So in some ways, rather than focusing on what everybody presumes are the men who are out there killing, right. and that's the big deal, yeah. you know, you got to think of the whole community mm -hmm. and what they had to do collect, even collecting the dung. Yeah, to, exactly. To do that. And then, as you mentioned, the processing yeah. As well, so it's a much bigger story. I know, and I played a little bit with the uprights, um, whether there were kids playing right. and like making these things while everybody was right. doing other stuff, or the kids collecting the rocks. Like right. you go down to the river and you bring up the rocks, right? And yeah. So that's it's you're right. It's the whole community yeah. engaged in the process. Yes. You mentioned uh, briefly First Nations consultants. Do you yeah. also have First Nations students taking up the work? You bet. Yeah, we have a lot of First Nations students at the University of Lethbridge. We're really fortunate. So, yeah, yeah. So just thinking about these uprights and just your bones, it's like a zoarchial just dream. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I'm like, or nightmare. <laughs> yeah, right. But um, just in terms of the trying to figure out what they were, how they were placed, and when, based on the sort of timing of the um, you know processing of these things, I obviously know. like a metapodials put down into the ground had to have been processed already yes. because otherwise you'd still have the toes stuck to them. Yeah, exactly. This is obviously not something they're doing right when they start the, right. the process. They would have had to have gone through all that sort of disarticulation. Yeah. Used older bones, but even then those would break. Or right. So it's, that helps target like maybe when they were doing this. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something as a prep for getting ready for the process. Right, especially because the the bones are really mixed and kind of underneath the bed itself. Mm -hmm. So it's that um, deliberate offering afterwards mm -hmm. or some sort of activity. I mean, we have um, lots of First Nation stories about the offering to the bison, giving back to the bison, um, like the Anishkum and things like that, where maybe there are parallels, but it's a lot older than any of the more recent sites and stories. So, yeah. But yeah, you're right. Like, they would have had, like, did they take the mandibles from the place that the person was processing the tongues and then collect those mandibles and then go and place them here? They, they would have had to or else, you know, everything is still impossible to get apart, right? Exactly. With all the yeah, yeah. meat and the hide and the fur and, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not at all comparable, but it might be an interesting thing in um, the late Paleolithic in uh, southwestern Europe. Uh, they've now located that in many of the cave sites that have the cave art, there's all sorts of bones stuck in the floor. And I could mm. give you a reference. Yeah, that'd be great. One bone stuck in the floor uh, in about 13 to 20 different sites in the southwestern part of France. And they also were sticking them into niches in the cave walls because there they are and you don't have cave wall niches, but you know, right. but doing something yeah. with bones. Yeah, there's something going on. In yeah. a site that was uh, bone processing. So right. Just, there's, there was just something about make, make, making some sort of connection through the bone to yeah. the, the floor. Yeah. I'll give you the reference. Oh, that'd yeah. be great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, uh, let's give uh, Sean a round of applause. Yeah. 
And again, thanks for having me. <laughs> Very interesting, expanding our horizons. <laughs>